Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for a new day, and we thank you, dear Father, that you have not let it, left us alone in this world, and that you know the end from the beginning, and you are, you are revealing to us the end from the beginning. We thank you and we praise you for that. We thank you for your precious word, and Lord, as we open uh, your word, as we consider the history and the message of uh, Elijah, we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would help us to understand more fully 1 Corinthians um, 10, 11, and all these things were written for, our ex for examples upon us who will live at the end of the world. We pray that your Holy Spirit would shine thy light upon thy word for us and open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to address for a moment uh, a discussion that came up yesterday concerning um, God sending down fire and uh, whether or not the devil is able to do that also. So uh, afterwards, after the class yesterday, uh, my wife brought up a statement that is uh, located in uh, Great Controversy, page 553. And we will read that here in a moment. Great Controversy, page 553. This is in the chapter, Can Our Dead Speak to Us? These persons overlook the testimony of the scriptures concerning the wonders wrought by Satan and his agents. It was by satanic aid that Pharaoh's magicians were enabled to counterfeit the work of God, which is what I brought up yesterday. Uh, Pharaoh's magicians and their work was a counterfeit, okay? We'll, we'll get into, into more of that here in, in a moment. And so it goes on, Paul testifies that before the second advent of Christ, there will be similar manifestations of satanic power. The coming of the Lord is to be preceded by the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. The Apostle John, describing the miracle working power that will be manifested in the last days, declares he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. Notice, which he had power to do. No mere impostures are here foretold. So it's not just a mere imposture. Men are deceived by the miracles which Satan's agents have power to do, not which they pretend to do. So whenever he, when, when uh, Satan makes fire come, uh, come down from heaven, that's real, okay? And then connected with that is a statement I was alluding to from Patriarchs and Prophets 264. Patriarchs and Prophets 264. So the magicians, she says, their Pharaoh's magicians did not really cause their rods to become serpents, but by magic, aided by the great deceiver, they were able to produce this appearance. It was beyond the power of Satan to change the rods to living serpents. The prince of evil, though possessing all the wisdom and might of an angel fallen, has not power to create or to give life, this is the prerogative of God alone. But all that was in Satan's power to do, he did. He produced a counterfeit. To human sight, the rods were changed to serpents. Such they were believed to be by Pharaoh and his court. There was nothing in their appearance to distinguish them from the, from the serpent produced by Moses. 
Though the Lord caused the real serpent to swallow up the spurious ones, yet even this was regarded by Pharaoh not as a work of God's power, but as the result of a kind of magic superior to that of his servants. So the conclusion I come from this paragraph is that those serpents of Pharaoh's, they had an appearance of reality. But it's, to kind of sum this up, it appears to be, I think, um, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, I sort of answers that in that when people do not desire to know the truth, then he allows them to receive strong delusion, and then he allows. There's sometimes, like at the, during uh, the story that we're addressing right now, there in 1 Kings 18, where God said, you know, pretty much he, he, he is restraining Satan from sending fire. Okay, that, that's, that's clear. He restrained Satan from answering the prayers of the priest of Baal. Okay, but that does not mean, and then we need to connect uh, Great Controversy, I almost forgot about that one, Great Controversy 589, and we read this a few weeks ago, 589, So, Great Controversy 589 says, Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature, and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. Wouldn't sort of lightning be part of the elements, in a, in a sense, okay? When he was suffered to afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another as in a moment. It is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah, and the Lord will do just what he had declared that he would. He will, he will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are, who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. And it goes on. So we can only conclude from that, I think, that at this time, at the end of the world, during the enforcement of the uh, mark of the beast and the enforcement of uh, worshiping his image, that God would allow Satan, whereas he didn't allow him before to do such things as sending fire from heaven. So I hope that kind of clears things up there on that issue. All right, going back to the notes, page 5. Um, from morning until noon. And as you see there in the notes, uh, morning being the third hour and noon being the sixth hour. Or in other words, from uh, using our time from 9 to 12 o'clock. All right. And so the statement, Christ was nailed to the cross between the third and the sixth hour, that is, between nine and twelve o'clock. In the afternoon, he died. This was the hour of the evening sacrifice. Then the veil of the temple, that which hid God's glory from the view of the congregation of Israel, was rent in twain from top to bottom. Um, there's a lot more to this and, uh, than what I'm going to uh, share right now, uh, just kind of leaving the, mo the notes just for a moment. Because, first of all, let's read um, Mark 15:33. Uh, could, could someone read that for us? Mark 15:33.
And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Okay. So there was darkness over the whole land. And I'm going to go now to, um, and this is not in your notes, to Christ Object Lessons, page 414 to 415. This is uh, in the last chapter of Christ Object Lessons. Regarding the, uh, the idea of darkness, you know, there was darkness around the cross. There was darkness there at the crucifixion of Christ. So Sister White says, the coming of the bridegroom, now notice, notice this chapter, even though it's quite obvious that in this paragraph she's talking about the midnight cry, okay, the coming of the bridegroom, all that, that parable. But notice this is in the chapter in Christ's object lessons to meet the bridegroom. So it's, it's this, this statement is couched in uh, that parable, the parable, parable of the bridegroom. The coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. Connect, if you will, in your minds, this darkest hour with Christ being on the cross at, quote unquote, the darkest hour. All right? The darkest hour. The coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. The days of Noah and Lot pictured the, the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. The scriptures pointing forward to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. His working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness. Now, this is connecting us back when it says work, Satan working miracles. Okay, this is, we just read... The statements were, you know, about Satan's bringing down fire from heaven, okay, during the time of the enforcement of the mark of the beast, the Sunday uh, Sabbath issue. His working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing dark darkness, the multitudinous errors, heresies, and delusions of these last days. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop in darkness deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people, it will be a night of trial. Over and over and over again, in one way or another, she's mentioning darkness, darkness, darkness. A night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. Okay, so we can expect that during this midnight darkness, God's light will shine. He causes the light to shine out of darkness. When the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So in the night of spiritual darkness, God's word goes forth. Let there be light. To his people, he says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold, says the scripture, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. It is the darkness of apprehension of God, I'm sorry, of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, at this time, during the darkness, during the darkness from the uh, third to the ninth hour, okay, it is the dark, I'm sorry, uh, at this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed. Now, she's not saying what that message is, but we, sh at, the very, at a very basic level, we should expect a message 
of present truth to be given to the world. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known into the darkness of the world, is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. And remember, we read yesterday, if you look there in your notes just for a moment, go back the very, almost the very beginning, the second paragraph on page one, God will have a fitting message to meet his people in their varied condition. Uh, God prepares the message to fit the time and occasion. This is during the time of gross darkness that we should expect a message. Now, um, one more point on all of that. And this is this is in four BC eleven sixty point nine. Four BC eleven sixty point nine. One sentence. And she's this is in her comments about Ezekiel's vision. All right. Many of the most glorious revelations recorded in the Bible were made by the Lord in the darkest days of earth's history. Okay. But is this time the darkest that has ever been spiritual? This is the, without a question. If, if, if we can't see that this is the darkest time of earth's history right now, and it's not even as dark as what it's going to get. If we can't see that, we are truly blind. Okay? And I, I just want to say once again that this light is given during our, in, between the third and the ninth hour. I'm, I'm repeating uh, Mark 15, 33 again. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And God's people will feel forsaken. It will appear that way. It's on your line, where's the sixth and ninth hour? Yeah, that's a good question. Where would be the sixth? Now, when, if you remember there early... On, I think yesterday, um, is this the, this is the wrong one, is it? No, I know it's over here. That um, Elijah rose early in the morning. So that would be. Early in the morning would be somewhere, it would, I believe you, we, we, we would put it, I'll just put it over here, third hour. The morning is the third hour. And then, because relying again on the statement that we read a moment ago, from 5 B.C. 1108, Christ was nailed to the cross between the third and the sixth hour, that is, between 9 and 12 o'clock. In the afternoon, he died. This was the hour of the evening sacrifice. And so when you go to 1 Kings 18, and twice it mentions the, uh, the evening sacrifice. Uh, during the time that, yeah, okay. There, verse 29, and it came to pass when midday was past, okay, midday is the sixth hour, 12, 12 o'clock, right? I always have to recheck myself. Yeah, the sixth hour is midday, 
And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And then you go a little bit further on, in verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So the, the, the offering of the evening sacrifice would be what? The ninth hour. Okay. So at least at one level, yeah, at the at the midnight cry, which you, which you would uh, you would have there the ninth hour. Where's the sixth? Yeah, where is the sixth? Good question. The ninth should be the ninth hour should should be December twenty fifth. Right. Not this. Okay. Yeah. So that's I'll all right. Move that. So and what reason do we have for that? Hiroshima. No. Oh yeah. You have the twenty sixth day of the fourth month. That's Okay, I was forgetting that. I should have a double in there. The, the midnight cry is the sixth. But those the ninth hour are going to be the sixth in relation to the nethanims. Say again? You have a double in there. The midnight cry is going to be the sixth hour. But the ninth hour is going to be the sixth hour for the nethanims. So you've got a... Yeah. Yeah. Got some overlay there. There's Elijah's comes to two different groups essentially, the Levites and yeah. the Nethanims. Yeah. Okay. Go a little bit further. Between the third and sixth hour, he's nailed to the cross. So he gets nailed to the cross before the midnight cry. That's a good question. Because I think there's a logic to that. It's this message. It's it's got to be put in the record before the sixth hour. So so there's a, a progression of this message. Um, but anyway, this is your presentation. Yeah, I don't there, have all the answers. Have yeah, created a dilemma for yeah. you to solve for us right now. Yeah, I don't have all the answers. I guarantee you. All right. Um, okay, next paragraph on page five. Oh, by the way, it says on another statement from 12MR385.1. It says that Sister White says, For three hours Christ hung upon the cross, looked upon by thousands. Three hours. 12MR what? 12MR385.1. <coughs> So that would be from the ninth to the twelfth. No, from the third Nine, to the sixth. It says, 12. Christ was nailed to the cross between the third and sixth hour. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. He was on the cross for three hours. Third to sixth is three hours. Right? Yes, three hours. It says three hours. Well. I don't know. I don't fully understand. It would seem like it would be more. Yeah, it seemed like it would go into beyond the sixth hour yeah. for him to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Any, what did 12 MR say again? 12 MR 385.1. Is it in our notes? No, I'm sorry, no it's not. Okay. What's it say? For three hours Christ hung upon the cross, looked upon by thousands. But it also says that God dwelleth in thick darkness. See, he, he was. Go ahead. No, I was just saying that he was there uh, while that darkness. So if we're, I don't know if that's the point, but it says it here if you keep going. Well, isn't yeah. the Sunday law supposed to represent the cross? And but if it represents the cross, that would have been the ninth hour, and then three hours later it would be midnight. In the. In the passage from 5 BC, if you're really careful to the world, words, it says Christ was nailed to the cross between mm -hmm. the third and sixth hour. Okay, that so doesn't mean you're from. Protect it, it would be the fourth and a half hour, and if he was going to hang on it for three hours, it would take him to the seventh and a half hour 
yeah where he died and that would be more in agreement with the idea of the evening sacrifice yeah and just because it says okay it, it says between so it doesn't mean from right. the third to the sixth hour if you and if you're going to be technical to the world word and I don't know that that that's what you're supposed to do necessarily but between means the middle yes where does it say between? In, in the second quote on page 5, Christ was nailed to the cross between the third and sixth hour. And the between the third and the sixth hour is four and a half. It, it, it isn't, yeah. isn't five, 5.30 between as well? Yeah, between can be a general, but, I, right. but it can be also dead center and dead center is the story of the cross. The cross is dead center in the chiasm yes. of 1260, 1260, yes. and Christ is dead center between two thieves. The cross is a dead center type issue. So if he then hangs on the cross for three hours, he hangs on the cross beyond the sixth hour. Yes. Which would give us on the line up there the idea that after 9-11, the message that's typified by the cross arrives before the midnight cry and extends beyond the midnight cry. And that, that's how we yeah. understand it, because yeah. it's a warning. All right, let's go to the next paragraph. Uh, it, just it, it does say that there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, so you could... Yeah. Yeah. To, and that's the whole earth, not yeah. just the cross. It was yeah. The and the darkness was only there whenever he was on the cross. <coughs> okay. Just not reading the entire paragraph there, but it says of, of the, um, this is from 3T 281.2. Concerning the priest of Baal, God has directed. Now, I, I, I think it's very important to notice God has directed this trial. Okay, you really, we should really. He also had to have taken him. They had to be had to take him down before sundown, which is right because he rested on the Sabbath. That would have been Friday night. To Saturday night. Point in. As far as when they the darkness has down. nothing to do with day or night. The darkness is a supernatural darkness. The Father turning away from this situation. I was just thinking of the three, three. But if we nine. stick to the one premise that she had, that we all have, is that the cross typifies a Sunday law. Yeah. And we include the premise that the, the trumpets are judgments for the Sunday law, then you would see the cross immediately before the midnight cry, and the midnight cry would be July 18th. The, yeah, because the Christ judgment. was arrested at midnight. It, be, it begins, I, I know he wasn't on the, was not on the cross then, but I mean, he was going to the cross. And then we would, anyway, you better get focused, my brother. Yeah. <laughs> so, Notice it says, God has directed this trial. This, this trial, okay, if the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him, okay? If God, uh, I mean, if your God uh, rains down fire upon your sacrifice, then your God is the God, then Baal is the God. But if God sends fire down to Elijah's, uh, and devours Elijah's sacrifice, then he is the God. So God has directed this trial. It, this reminds me of, in a kind of a disconnected way, but still reminds me of God directing, His hand directed these charts, okay? And also the uh, present situation that we are in today, okay? There, there is a trial concerning this message. God is in this message and He has directed this trial and has prepared confusion for the authors of idolatry and a signal triumph for his name. So when God is directing this, 
there is going to be a signal triumph for his name. All right. We could dwell on that for a, a while. Uh, next one uh, concerning confusion, Isaiah 45, 16. Would someone read that for us? Isaiah 45, 16. And I think this, this idea, this thought is more than once in the scriptures. But this is only one. Isaiah 45, 16. They shall be ashamed and also confounded all of them that shall go to confusion together. They shall. Oh, they shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know what someone is thinking, <laughs> and, and, and you're absolutely right. You got the present uh, heresy that is being put forth out there that we're required to worship idols, and these people will be brought to confusion. And we don't, we don't need to go to Genesis 11, 1 to 9. We, we all understand that at the Tower of Babel, the Tower, the, the tower of Babel were brought to confusion, and their tower was their idol in a sense. Uh, but for sure the, the idea that they're teaching that you're supposed to worship idols is the old news <clears throat> the new news is that these members have Antifa that are destroying property and stores in this in the cities of the United States right now and looting. that is justified because Jesus did that when he cleansed the temple <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a, con a lot of confusion. Talk about a yep. lot of darkness. Yet they, they uh. stay. They stay there. And I know people say, oh, they're hypnotized, they're hypnotized. And I said to Jeff, at what point in time do they realize that they're in darkness like that? And he says, many of them already know that. Do you think that? Yeah, you know, and, and just speaking personally, okay, you know, this idea of, of these people and that were once in this movement actually believing that we're required to worship idols. I know. For me personally, look, I was raised Catholic. I bowed before statues, idols, okay? Okay. If you if you if you partake of something, some some food that that makes you vomit, and you realize, you know, I shouldn't have done that. That was just bad, bad, you know. And but someone else sees you do that. Well, I can do that too, or I, I think that that would be a good thing to do, you know. I'd say, go ahead, man. You know, you want to be no, okay. All right. Yeah. If you cloak it with some sugar and put some stuff on it, you know. <laughs> that's All right. What it is. Yeah. Sugar. Sister White calls it sugar-coated poison or something like that. <laughs> All right. Um, next paragraph. There, the morning passes and noon comes, and yet there is no move of their gods to pity, in pity, to. Baal's priest, the deluded idols of worship, of, of idols. No voice answers their frantic cries. The priests are continually devising how by deception they can kindle a fire upon the altars and give the glory to Baal. But the firm eye of Elijah watches every motion. 800 voices become hoarse. Can you imagine 800 voices? Okay, their garments are covered with blood, and yet their frantic excitement does not abate. Their pleadings are mingled with cursings to their sun god that he does not send fire for their altars. Elijah stands by, watching with eagle eye, lest any deception should be practiced, for he knows that if by any device they could kindle their altar fire, he would be torn in pieces upon the spot. He wishes to show the people the folly of their 
doubting and halting between two opinions when they have the wonderful works of God's majestic power in their behalf. And innumerable, and I want to put in there, heaps of testimony where Elijah's from, Gilead, innumerable evidences of his infinite mercies and loving kindness toward them. All right, then the next one here, uh, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Okay, we won't read that entire paragraph, but I just want to bring up the definition in, on the next page, page 6, of mocked. Mocked, if you look it up in the Greek, I'm sorry, the Hebrew dictionary, in the Strong's, it means de to deride. And if you look up then deride in the 1828 dictionary, to laugh at in contempt, to turn to ridicule or make sport of, to mock, to treat with scorn by laughter. Let's read now uh, Proverbs 1, 22 to 33. Would someone read that for us? Proverbs. Be, couldn't that be considered teasing? I'm just going to rely on the definition. If you okay, want to but say, I wonder what the definition of teasing is. Yeah, but it's not in the definition. I, I get your point. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? How far? 21, 22 and 20, 22 to 33. Turn you at my proof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you, because I have called, and you refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But you have said it not, all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. They shall, they sh therefore they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Okay, now, question. We, we've already covered this, okay? You may think I'm changing the subject entirely, but you'll, you'll understand here in a moment. In the story of Elijah from 1 Kings 17 to 18, how many years? 1260. 1260 days days, you had uh, the drought, all right? And so at the end of those days, when those days are finished, then you have how many days? One. One day, okay? So notice that in 1 Kings one twenty six, First 1 Kings one twenty six. I'm sorry, not First Kings one twenty. The in Jeff Proverbs, just read it. Proverbs, Proverbs one twenty six. Proverbs one twenty six says, "I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when when your fear cometh." And so this mocking happens at the end of the twelve hundred sixty years or days. You see that? You see the connection there? No coincidences in God's Word. So let's jump down to um, the middle paragraph on page 6 of your notes. Elijah's turn has come, has now come. And Elijah said unto the people, by the way, the previous, the previous paragraph says, okay, they feel anxious to hear what Elijah will speak. So now Elijah will speak. And whether you're speaking about, on a, on a prophetic level, the speaking of the United States, at the same time you have the speaking of God's prophet. So Elijah has, Elijah's turn has now come, and Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, 
and it says that he repaired the altar. Okay, now I'm going to drop down to the bold. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that, th that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench, and all the people saw it, and and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And I so stuck. Does yes. Does that mean at that point in time that there will be those that <clears throat> fall on their faces and they say, He is God. He is the Lord. This, the, the, this, that where, they, where they're at. Br sim Symbolically, spiritually, yes. I mean, you'd have to really, you'd have to go through the scriptures to get a full understanding of the the import of the of the fact that they fell on their faces. You'd have to go through all the scripture, line upon line, where a, a person or people fell on their faces. What does that mean? But in the context of this story of this passage, they admit that Jehovah is God, okay? And as I tried to emphasize in past presentations, that whenever they say, the Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is the God, that that word Lord means Jeho Jehovah. That's the original. It means Jehovah. And what does the name Jehovah mean? It means the self-existent one. It means also the one who brings it to pass. So, in essence, when they fall on their faces, at a very simple level, they are admitting that July 18th was indeed a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And because of the doubling, we know that is midnight cry time period. Yes. <coughs> okay. Now, notice, yes. Uh, the... An understanding that we that's in this movement already is that when in Daniel 10, Daniel has the vision where he sees Christ. The group that is with him flees, but he falls upon his face. Yes. So this is at one level uh, the Mari vision. What they're seeing is the appearance of Christ. Amen. In that in that history that unfolded there. Amen. Amen. Yes. Who, the people that fell were the ones that were there not saying anything. Right. They're the Levites. The, the prophets of Baal and the priests of the grove are the people that used to be in this movement. Okay. Yes. That's they're, the, they're not yes. the ones falling they're, they're on their get No, they're going to get slain by, the, by Elijah. He kills every one of them himself. But Israel's watching this. Israel is the Levites. Yes. Comment? Yes, I wanted to ask about repairing the altar before July 18th. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, for years ago, whenever I presented uh, uh, 1 Kings 17 and 18, when we didn't know as much as what we know now, I always connected that with Isaiah 58. The, 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 you know, the, the, how does it put it? Uh, the repair of the breach, raising up the foundations of many generations, okay? So, on a very basic level, of course, it would be, you know, as we go back in time in this movement, when the foundations were laid in this movement, okay, from 9 11 to 2013, 14. Yeah. Okay, so, but then you can also take that probably and put it as far as the foundations, probably I'm sort of, sort of questioning, but I'm, I'm almost sure it would be the case from uh, September 9th. Okay, when we go back to the foundations, September 9th to uh, January 11th, yes. 
that's how I, I would describe it. When the Omega arrived 2014 until September, the foundational truths are getting destroyed. But in September 2019, now there's a work of gathering the old truths together. Uh, it's also interesting to note that Elijah is dealing with Israel, and Israel is the ten northern tribes. Judah and Benjamin are not in this story. This is the ten northern tribes in the story of Elijah. But when Elijah repairs the altar, it's twelve stones, not ten. Mm -hmm. So the, his work is for yes. the Levites and the priests. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an altar that had been broken down. Yep. And at various levels, the altar had been broken down, including before September 7th. People that were in this movement became priests of Baal. And they broke it down. And they broke it down, yes. So are we saying that on September, that that's when the dirt brush man came in and they're starting, he's starting to sweep away the rubbish? Yeah. That's in that history. Yep. Yep. Oh, All right. Well, if we could add that it also means church being established then at, at uh, July 18th, it's the 144,000, the true 12 foundation. Yes, yes, yes. And there's a place where she talks about when the fire comes down upon that offering that the stones are illuminated. Yes. Okay, so the... Amen. The 144,000 then become an ensign. They're yes. Illuminated. Illuminated. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you for all the input. Yes. Okay, so the next passage here I'm gonna, I've, I've taken from Prophets and Kings 153, dealing with the same story. The people on the mount prostrate themselves in awe before the unseen God. They dare not continue to look upon the heaven sent fire. They fear that they themselves will be consumed and convicted of their duty to acknowledge the God of Elijah as the God of their fathers to whom they owe allegiance. They cry out together with, as with one voice, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God, or Jehovah, he is the God. He is the God that brings it to, brings it to pass. With startling distinctness, the cry resounds over the mountain and echoes in the plain below. At last, Israel is aroused, undeceived, penitent. At last, the people see how greatly they have dishonored God. The character of Baal worship. Notice this, this sentence. The character of Baal worship in contrast with the reasonable service required by the true God stands fully revealed. That's of prime importance when you consider 1 Kings 18, 39, when the people fall down and prostrate themselves and say, the Lord, He is the God. Now they understand the, the contrast between the Baal worship and the reasonable service required by the true God. And I want to connect with that. With that, with, it was. Would with, with someone read uh, Second Second Chronicles, chapter twelve, verses six through eight. Second Chronicles twelve six through eight. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. And this, you know, you could, you could go a lot, of a lot of places with this verse 8, but it should be at the very least connected with, with the... Uh, history of Israel choosing a king in the first place during the time of, uh, of, uh, of the prophet Samuel. God wanted them to understand the, uh, the, the contrast between the service of the nations, the kingdoms of the countries, that is, 
and, and his service. All right, it starts right there. Okay, and so he allows them to have a king so that hopefully they will learn through that experience the difference, the contrast between uh, the service of the nations and the service of God. And this, just that subject in and of itself is a, is a, is a broad, very broad subject. Uh, but I don't want to uh, minimize that sentence. The character of Baal worship in contrast with the reasonable service required by the true God stands fully revealed. The people recognize God's justice and mercy in withholding the dew and the rain until they have been brought to confess his name. They are ready to ad now to admit that the God of Elijah is above every idol and also when you connect this with uh, the 2520 of Leviticus 26, that was the object that God uh, designed that the people would be through the, ex the experience of the uh, captivity of the 2520. They would be brought to admit that God had walked contrary to them. Uh, and I've already mentioned John 13, 19 in previous presentations, and when, and when the people saw it, that's the same thing as John 13, 19, uh, where Christ said, uh, and I always... I tell you before it comes, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am He. Thank you. That's, that's, part, that's also part of, of, of the whole thing that we should understand. We, un, like, I think even... I forget whether it was Jeff or Kathy just a moment ago mentioned that they are, they, they well, Jeff mentioned it, the, uh, the Mari vision, okay, that's the Mari vision. When you see, actually see Christ in the fulfillment of prophecy, okay. Um, let's drop down now to uh, the last paragraph on page 7. After the victim is laid upon the altar, he, Elijah, commands the people to flood the sacrifice and the altar with water and to fill the trench round about the altar. He then reverentially, by the way, just as a, just a brief mention, why, why, why do you think that Elijah poured water on the sacrifice? It doesn't say it. To show them that it's, it's going to be God that brings this flames. Yeah. Not yeah. anybody else. Yeah. It's going to be so soaked that nobody yeah. could light a match to start it. Yeah, the priest or, or anybody, not just a priest, but Israel watching all of this, and it, you can't help but think that they were thinking, why is he doing that? It, there's no way in the world that f any fire is going to light that. All the, all the huge amounts of water that he's pu pouring on top of the sacrifice, and it, it just overflowed in, into the trench. You know, it filled up the trench. It just looked impossible, just like it looks impossible right now. That it's not looking impossible, though, really now. Anybody has their eyes open, you know, as far as the event on July 18th. But anyway, so uh, he then reverentially, this is, this is the second sentence in that last paragraph on page 7, he then reverentially bows before the unseen God, raises his hands toward heaven, and offers a calm and simple prayer, unattended with violent gestures or contortions of the body. No shrieks resound over Carmel's height. A solemn silence, which is oppressive to the priest of Baal, rests upon all. In his prayer, Elijah makes use of no extravagant expressions. He prays to Jehovah as though he were nigh, witnessing the whole scene and hearing his sincere, fervent, yet simple prayer. Baal's priests have screamed and foamed and leaped and prayed very long. From morning until near evening, Elijah's prayer is very short, earnest, reverential and sincere. No sooner is that prayer uttered than flames of fire descend from heaven in a distinct manner, like a brilliant flash of lightning. 
kindling the wood for sacrifice and consuming the victim, licking up the water in the trench and consuming even the stones of the altar. The brilliancy of the blaze illumines the mountain and is painful to the eyes of the multitude. The people of the kingdom of Israel not gathered upon the mount are watching with interest those there assembled. As fire descends, they witness it and are amazed at the sight. It resembles the pillar of fire at the Red Sea by which night separated the children of Israel from the Egyptian host. There is so much in that paragraph. But one of the, one of the main things I want to emphasize there is using the next passage from Great Controversy about Elijah raising his hands toward heaven. Um, this is from volume 3 of the testimonies actually mentioning the same incident but in a little bit different way just reading the bold it says raising his hands to heaven he solemnly affirms by the living God who made the heavens and the earth the judgments which would come upon Israel there would be there shall there shall not be dew nor rain these years but according to my word this is going back in the whole narrative, we read this a few presentations ago. I'm just reminding us of the fact that at the beginning, at the beginning, at 1 Kings 17 verse 1, Elijah raises his hands toward heaven and he gives uh, Ahab the message, there shall not be dew nor rain, but according to my word, for 1260 uh, days, and he mentions that the God who made the heavens and the earth. Okay, so, and at the end, Elijah does the same thing. When he's praying to God to hear his prayer, that he would rain down fire upon his sacrifice. Again, Elijah raises his hands toward heaven. And we've already connected with that a few presentations ago. Uh, 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 Daniel 12 and verses 6 and 7, where... Uh, uh, Daniel sees uh, Christ lifting his hands to, towards, towards heaven. We have connected with that also at Revelation 10, where Christ raises his hands up to heaven. And uh, she's actually quoting, when you look at that passage from volume 3, she's quoting, you can tell, part of Revelation 10, because that's where Christ raises his hands up to heaven and uh, affirms he, uh, he swears by the living God who made the heavens and the earth. All right, Allu an allusion towards uh, the, 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 the Sabbath. But now further on, making an, another connection here of raising hands, if you'll, no you'll notice from the passage from Great Controversy 613.2, when at the middle of the paragraph, then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a solemn, rather loud voice says, It is done, and all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement. So even you have kind of the angels, you know, they're humbling themselves before God when he makes this announcement, all right? And, of course, Christ makes the announcement of the close of probation. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So it's, it's easy to see that when fire comes down from God out of heaven, there in uh, 1 Kings 18, that this is a close of probation. At the very least, this is a close of probation for a... For the priests, for the priests, it is done. And, of course, you have the solemn silence, Zechariah 2.12. Would someone read that for us? We're about to close here. Zechariah 2.12 and 13 and also Habakkuk 2.20. Zechariah 2, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Okay, and in Habakkuk 2.20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. 
And so my only object and my only purpose in bringing these all together is showing that you have uh, silence at the close of probation and during the time of Elijah, there in 1 Kings 18, you had silence at the close of probation. All right? And Elijah raising his hands, Elijah representing Christ, raising his hands up to heaven and making the solemn announcement. It's also in 220, which would be 220. Yes. Restoration. Yes. And Zechariah, when he's choosing Jerusalem, and Jerusalem's chosen at the midnight cry. Amen. So, the next paragraph, bottom paragraph, take the prophets of Baal, let, it, let not one of them escape. The people are ready to obey his word. They seize the false prophets who have, who have deluded them and bring them to the brook Kishon, and there with his own hand, Elijah slays these idolatrous priests. We're not going there. I'm just going to make mention of this. I may address this in a later presentation, a, a later series maybe, but bringing them down to the brook Kishon, there are other evidences in the scriptures where it doesn't mention the brook Kishon, but it mentions like the river Euphrates. God, the Lord, has a sacrifice at the river Euphrates. And that sacrifice, of course, is not... Um, it's a strange act. It's a strange act. It's, it's not a sacrifice like that, that would imply Christ's sacrifice at all. It's a sacrifice of... Punishment. Of what? Punishment. Of punishment. So anyway, that's a whole, whole other subject all by itself. But nevertheless, I just want to mention here that there's, you can, there are grounds to believe that this... That this slaying of the prophets of Baal are a sacrifice. Okay, we'll deal with that later. All right, so... And then what happens after that? You have the rain. Uh, there, bottom paragraph of page 8 of your notes, and he, uh, and the judgments of God have been executed upon the false priests, the people having confessed their sins and acknowledged their God, their father's God, the withering curse of God is now to be withdrawn and he is to renew his blessings unto his people, in other words, he's renewing, he's re renewing his covenant with his people, and again refresh the earth with dew and rain. Elijah addresses Ahab, get thee up and eat and drink. For there is a sound of abundance of rain. And then dropping down uh, by the middle of the paragraph, his servant returned. This is, I'll just read the entire paragraph. While Ahab went up to feast, Elijah went up from the fearful sacrifice to the, mount, to the top of Mount Carmel to pray. His work of slaying the pagan priest had not unfitted him for the solemn exercise of prayer. He had performed the will of God after he had, as God's instrument, done what he could to remove the cause of Israel's apostasy by slaying the, the idolatrous priests. He could do no more. He then intercedes in behalf of sinning apostate Israel in the most painful position, his face bowed between his knees, he most earnestly supplicates God to send rain. Six times in succession he sends his servant to see if there is any visible token that God has heard his prayer. It reminds me of Noah's flood and Noah, after, before the flood waters had, had abated, uh, Noah sent out the dove. I didn't think about that till the other day. But anyway, um, so he... he uh, he continues in earnest prayer, sending his servant seven times to see if God has granted any signal. His servant returns the sixth time from his outlook toward the sea with the, discour with the discour discouraging report that there is no sign of clouds forming in the brassy heavens. The seventh time he informs Elijah that there is a small cloud to be seen about the size of a man's hand. This is enough to satisfy the faith of Elijah. 
He does not wait for the heavens to gather blackness to make the matter sure. In that small rising cloud, his faith hears the sound of abundance of rain. This is the flood. His works are in accordance with his faith. He sends a message to Ahab by his servant, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. So will, we, so will the message slay spiritually all the priests of Baal and the prophets of the grove? Okay, could you... Yeah, it will. The will the message slay the priests of Baal, the prophets of Baal, and the priests of the grove? Yes. And yes, it will, because it's... This was the issue. Was their sacrifice correct, or is Elijah's correct? Once Elijah is proven to be correct, they're finished. Their, their yeah. prophecy is proven to be foolishness. Satanic. Let ministers and people remember that gospel truth ruins if it does not save. The soul that refuses to listen to the invitations of mercy from day to day can soon listen to the most urgent appeals without an emotion stirring his soul. So the very message that they rejected slays them. Slayed him with the sword. The sword of his mouth. His word. His word. The word, yeah. All right, let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the story of Elijah. We thank you for helping us to take the message of 1 Kings 17 and 18 to our day. And we pray, Father, that uh, the study of these things will not cease with this presentation, but that you would help each, each one of us to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that we might be fitted for the great outpouring of thy Holy Spirit in the latter reign and be prepared also for the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please help us to remain faithful unto the end. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.